the day. It's Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. Welcome to the show. I am, as the name of the show shows, Corey Morgan. We do this once a week, every Wednesday. It's live, cover news, talk to guests. I rant and rave, get it out of my system. And we interact with you guys in the viewer scroll. So thanks for joining, guys. And uh, let's make use of that comment scroll. I mean, these are the advantages of being live. We get to interact. I get to get your questions to the guests, your questions to me, statements, discuss things with each other. I see some great conversations going on sometimes in the uh, in the discussion scroll over there off to the side. Just trying to keep it civil. I've seen some pretty good fights break out in there too. I mean, it's the internet, right? Numbers, whether it's a, a cat forum or, or uh, a, a discussion of TV shows, it seems people are capable of getting at each other's throats. Uh, just, you know, we can take it seriously, but not take it too personally. And I do read all of those comments and I do appreciate them. Reminds me that I'm not just, uh, talking to my, uh, car radio or something like that. There really are people out there tuning in and listening in. So we got a good one. I've got, uh, lawyer Christopher Considine coming on a little later. He was involved. Uh, he was supposed to come on last week. Couldn't make it. He was involved in the Sue Rodriguez case for those who might remember it back in the nineties. Uh, and uh, we're going to be talking about medical assistance in dying, a nice, light, simple subject to cover today. Of course, we'll have our news check-in with Dave Naylor in a little bit, and uh, we will uh, have the agricultural report and lots of news and things and such. So we'll start with what I'm ranting about. Now, this is actually uh, a column I'd posted uh, a, a couple of days ago, but this subject is still going on. And I think, you know, for the people who you should be subscribed and you should be reading my column. But if you haven't already, I want to get it out there on video as well. Because people need to, there's a lot of misinformation about what treaties are, what treaty rights are, and what's in them. So let's clarify some of that. So, I mean, to start with, to start with, every treaty is available on the internet in full. And they're remarkably short, simple documents. I mean, most of the text within a treaty, it's spent defining the terms and defining the boundaries of new indigenous reserves. A large part of treaties go into detail on how Indigenous signatories are also ceding all further claims to lands and rights outside of what the treaty has determined. That section of the treaty is the most abused one in the modern times, actually. Now, aside from that, the treaties tend to call for things such as a small annual stipend for chiefs and headmen, along with the provision of some agricultural implements. In Treaty 6, for example, the Crown's obligated to provide ammunition and guarantee hunting rights for Indigenous citizens on their reserves. This is where some legislation is indeed threatening treaty rights, as Prime Minister Trudeau's Bill C-21 could lead to the seizure of firearms that Indigenous citizens use for hunting. Treaty 1 and Treaty 2, they call for the provision of schools for the children on reserves. So, yeah, while people don't like to talk about it, access to schools was enshrined as a right in some treaties and probably inspired some of the residential school systems. And treaty signatories signed on wanting that education for their kids. So give those treaties a read. They're interesting. Now, most of the things people reference as being treaty rights in Canada, they're actually rights and benefits conferred by the Indian Act. And there's many things wrong with that act, but it isn't entrenched within the treaties. And it's an act. It can be amended or even scrapped. Treaty rights have been violated before. It's usually a matter of land being taken or obligations for land not filled. Our courts have been settling many of those disputes already. When it comes to the legislation being entrenched within Alberta and Saskatchewan, where we're asserting provincial rights, there's no conflict with any treaties. Before indulging somebody's point when they claim a treaty right's being violated somehow, just ask them which right and which treaty. It's easy enough to check online right on the spot with your phone. They're all out there and they're small. Chances are no rights probably actually being violated. With the ability to instantly fact check claims of treaty rights, we should be calling out those claims as soon as we hear them. They've been hampering rational policy discussions for too long already, and we don't need to let that happen anymore. Right now, we've got the chiefs uh, lined up. It seems Rachel Notley has managed to get them together and claim they weren't consulted now in the Sovereignty Act. Guys, we don't have an obligation to consult them, to bring in legislations. I mean, there's, we still want to consult people as much as possible, as we do with the rest of the electorate. But there's no obligation. And the only way that would come in is if people say, well, now it's constitutional. No, it's not. If there was a problem with the treaty. But there is no problem with the treaty. So all I'm saying is, have a look, guys. Get out there and read those treaties. It'll add a lot more clarity to these discussions because right now people have a really poor idea of what they're about. All right, that's what's got me going because, yes, uh, we're seeing all the guns being pulled out against Daniel Smith's uh, Sovereignty Act within the United Canada for now. We'll see. All right, let's check in and see what else is going on out there with our news editor, Dave Naylor. There's lots of other stuff going on. Hey, Dave, how's it going? It's going well, Corey. Uh, 
Just wondering if you could uh, tell our fill-in uh, producer today, Justin, that after four minutes, it's already one nothing for his French team. Okay. Well, he appears to be happy about that. He's, he's pumping his fist in, uh, in uh, jubilation. Oh, exactly. Nothing better than the, the World Cup to get the old uh, uh, juices going. So, uh, speaking of getting in juices going, since uh, Elon Musk took over Twitter, Corey, uh, have you seen any noticeable changes in your, uh, your tweeting? Uh, my tweeting hasn't changed. I've gained about 4,000 more followers and a lot more engagement, though. Oh, so that's good. So what, do you think you were being suppressed? I, you know, I really like to see that put out there because I'm very curious about it Be, because I really was having a hard time gaining followers for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, it's no coincidence, you can see the pattern. My engagement has doubled. And uh, yeah, I'm gaining over 100 followers a day when before it was more like uh, one or two. So it uh, seems to be quite a coincidence. Yeah, miracle of miracles, isn't it? Well, speaking of Elon Musk, uh, he uh, is the main story on our uh, website right now, Corey, uh, because he sort of uh, came, came out again against uh, Pierre Trudeau, or not Pierre Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's Bill C-11, uh, saying that it, uh, it sounds like censorship. Uh, so that's uh, hopefully some uh, some good news uh, on that front. Uh, we've got a, a weird and wonderful story out of Lamont, Alberta, where a, uh, a, a, I guess a nursing aide or an attendant at the Lamont uh, old folks home uh, has been charged because she was taking pictures of residents and then putting bug-eyed filters on their faces and sending them out on social media. So I don't even think you would do that, Corey, uh, on, on Twitter. Uh, our David Creighton is uh, questioning whether we have uh, reached rock bottom in society. And he's got some uh, interesting uh, anecdotes uh, for him uh, to back up that argument. Uh, Pierre Polyev uh, today told his caucus in Ottawa that uh, as soon as or if and when they become government, uh, they will improve health care uh, immediately by taking down the gatekeepers and allow foreign trained doctors uh, uh, to be able to, to, to work in hospitals uh, within 60 days. So uh, already lots of stuff on the uh, on the website, Corey, lots more to come uh, this afternoon and uh, two more hours of thrilling uh, World Cup action. Great. Uh, it sounds like you might have a bit of an outbreak of tuberculosis going on behind you. And I, I uh, hope it all remains safe in the newsroom today. Uh, it's that bastard Jonathan Bradley gave it to me. <laughs> oh, well, we'll uh, see if it all passes through before the holidays. Exactly. Right on. Okay, thanks, Dave. <laughs> uh, always the coughs and sniffles and everything. Hey, you know, that's normal for fall. I mean, it's, it's funny. And it is funny. You know, people are more self-conscious about coughing in public than they are about farting in public. Now, I mean, you can drop a, a bomb somewhere. People don't uh, smile on it and everything else. But I tell you, all you have to do is cough or sneeze once or twice, and they run off in every direction and glare at you over something, again, that uh, really didn't uh, didn't really hurt or harm people as much as people like to make it out to me. I, I don't want to go into the whole COVID discussion, but, you know, I'm always more than happy to discuss flatulence when I can manage to sidetrack into that uh, favorite subject of mine. But, yes, it's the flu season, and... Uh, you know, people, uh, you know, as, as Ashley's saying, stay, stay home when you're sick. Yeah, he's, he's not really sick or anything. There's just a, a bit of a cough going, but you still got to watch for those things. You don't want to wipe out a, a workplace with a bunch of people feeling ill and, and uh, having something go around. It's, it's all common sense. But no, he's, he's quite fine. So this is my reminder to folks, you know, get on there and subscribe. This is how we pay our bills. I mean, we're talking about Elon Musk and others exposing the censorship and the problems going on out there. And uh, C-18, I'll talk about that in a minute. That's the, the liberal bill that's really screwing with things and then giving the mainstream media an advantage. Well, the reason, the way we can bypass them, guys, is through subscribers. Get on there. we got thousands of subscribers. That's most of how we're paying our bills, and we really do appreciate it. $9.99 a month, 100 bucks a year, and you get uh, full access to all of our articles, columns, all of that good stuff as it comes out, and it's really appreciated on our part. And then, <clears throat> then you don't get that government censorship. Good Lord. It's going around, I swear. I don't have a cough. <coughs> but a scratch in the throat. <clears> throat. Yeah, I'm sure it's all in my head. So, yeah, let's talk about C-18 for a second. It looks like that one is going to be going through. I believe it's going through the House of Commons today. Then it'll be passed on to the Senate. Now, that one's a really odious one, and, and it's confusing to a lot of people. But basically what it does is it puts the screws to the social media giants and forces them to pay media outlets for content. 
it's really screwy. So basically, if the Globe and Mail, uh, you know, or in any of those other government-funded, bailed-out uh, news publications put an article on Facebook, and I, I believe they're trying to hit Google and some others with it, then Facebook somehow has to track and pay back a portion of revenue to those uh, news content uh, uh, providers. I mean, it's going to lead to battles between the social media giants and our, and our conventional media and our, and our government. Well, those battles are already going on. The bottom line is, and this has been lobbied for all the way through, legacy media is dying. But rather than fix themselves, rather than realize why nobody wants to listen to their shit anymore, they want to get the government to intervene and save their butts. You know, you've got to change with the times. You, you can't force people to consume your pap, and it is pap. Part of the problem we already had, and that's what, you know, this brings the problem about onto themselves to a degree. They got, what, the $600 million bailout package, plus there's all sorts of programs and subsidies disguised and cloaked as all sorts of things getting into the newsrooms and media outlets all across the country. Well, the bottom line is what happens then? They become beholden to the government. Their coverage goes to crap. It becomes slanted. It becomes, you know, unpalatable to people. So that just actually compounded the problem. More people left mainstream media, legacy media, and moved to outlets like ours. So then they're screaming and yelling, the government's got to do something to save us. Well, no, put out better stuff. Draw in viewers, listeners, readers. But they don't want to do that. They want to be bailed out again. So this C-18, this intrusive bill, would give a massive edge to the heavyweights, to the CBCs, to the globals. Because, uh, you know, what's, what's her name there? Rachel Gilmore. You know, she's not bringing in viewers and listeners with global, with her, my, I mean, she might as well be a comms person for the liberals. It's just so blatant. Uh, they want to force you to pay for them one way or another, rather than actually just let the free market deal with it. C18 is going to cause a terrible, terrible mess. And, and I suggest that people go to Michael Geist because it, it's still, it's a nuanced, odd thing that in the hearings, they've rushed it through, they've bashed it through. Media experts anyways have always said it's a bad bill. But it doesn't matter. It's all about controlling information, and it's about bailing out that media. I, I mean, the biggest boost in uh, subscribers we ever had in, in one period was during the truckers' convoy. And it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't because we had the most incredible coverage out there, though I like to say it was very good. I, I'm certainly biased. But what it was also was going on was the legacy media embarrassed itself. They were so grossly biased. Even people watching the coverage of CBC, CTV Global, which all looked exactly the same, they just looked like they were written by liberal templates, realized, even if you didn't like the convoy, like, this isn't coverage. This is propaganda. We can't stomach this. We can't take this. And they sought out other outlets, and they subscribed. These guys are killing themselves. <clears throat> they don't know it. They don't seem to realize it. C-18, it won't save them, but it'll really make a hell of a mess out of everything else for the rest of us for a while while they try to figure it out. And we've got important things. Uh, you know, so CSS, this is some of the stuff. For, uh, so Michael Geist is a fella. If you want to look him up, he's been covering a lot of this. He's, he's a, a professor. I believe he's a lawyer. He specializes in things like internet law. And he's, of course, been very outspoken on this whole thing. And, and he's writing daily. So search it out after the show and have a look at this. And, and I mean, some of the things he's saying... Uh, uh, in his own blog, was pointing out that the government cut off debate at second reading, they excluded dozens of witnesses, expanded the bill to hundreds of broadcasters that might not even produce news. They denigrated online news services as not real news. I suspect they're sort of pointing our way with that one. And shrugged off violations in copyright law. Like, this thing is a mess. But uh, it could manage to push some uh, independent outlets out of business. It could really screw them up. And uh, Jim Henry pointing out, yes, we had the best coverage in Coots, at least. Yes, and that's where we did have James on the ground out there in Coots in person. And boy, we had a lot of people tuning into that. That was exclusive stuff. When the legacy media either wasn't there or barely covered it all. So enough patting myself on the back. Let's see what else is going on. This is stuff that legacy media doesn't like talking about. Trade Minister Mary Ng yesterday, we were probably hearing about this. This is a cabinet minister giving sole source contracts to a friend. In other words, hey, I got a job. Here's some government money for you. And uh, it was found to be an inexcusable breach of the Conflict of Interest Act by the Ethics Commissioner. So you know what her penalty was? Nothing. Not a damn thing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. She, she apologized. Oh, she, I'm sorry. She still has her job. She's still there. She's still a cabinet minister. No fines. No punishments. 
Certainly no resignation, though, of course, there's people calling for it, but I get tired of that, too. The opposition always calls for everybody to resign, whether it's a conservative opposition calling for it or the NDP. Fine, wait it out until the next election, then people can fire them. But when you've actually breached conflicts of interest laws, it means you broke a law. You should pay a penalty, not if you're in the liberal government, guys. Why isn't this making more headlines? Because we have legacy media that doesn't want to report negatively about the liberal government. That's why. So, yeah, she gave contracts, let's see, to uh, uh, $23,000, basically, to a public relations firm, uh, which was run by her very good friend of nearly 20 years. They used to vacation together and uh, celebrated birthdays and holidays together. You know, real close buddies. Hey, what's 20 grand, you know? Yeah, we got problems, and that's why we need independent media, media that's not afraid to report on these things. They're not afraid to rock the boat, or we won't hear enough about them. So yeah, she's going to carry on. The thing that bothers me more, though, as I said, it should go to the point when they will be fired by the electorate. And uh, we see like with the recent by-election in Toronto area or Ontario, uh, I, I don't see much appetite for Ontario or Montreal to get rid of any of these corrupt liberals. They, they like them. That's, that's their people out there. And uh, they're just going to keep putting them back over and over again. That gets back to the uh, independence that I tend to push for quite often here. Uh, Paradoxy pointing out as well, yeah, the Governor General's you know trip to Kuwait, two hundred seventy-one dollar salad. <laughs> like again, we aren't hearing enough about this. It is out there. The alternative uh, outlets are covering it. Here's an interesting one. You know, it's kind of ties into the, the this whole thing. So American lawmakers are considering a ban on TikTok within the United States over security concerns of the Chinese-owned social media video app. Now, this is interesting because I mean it's huge. It's it's huge, and and if you take away a platform like that, you intervene that directly on a platform, it's going to have repercussions. Yet at the same time, and I wrote on that recently, uh, we do have to be concerned about uh, you know, a, a lot of ways that the, the Chinese companies and the Chinese government have sort of infiltrated their way into uh, companies and, and, and policies out here in North America and at least be wary of it. But at the same time, they, they provide a lot of products and services that we consume and we quite enjoy. We don't want to haphazardly just, I mean, some people say that, oh, just, just get rid of everything Chinese. Well, you have a look around your household and uh, think of your consumer goods and your cost of living before you say something like that. Because, uh, you know, we can't just stop the, the importation of those Chinese goods or some of those uh, Chinese softwares or intellectual properties. We're, we're quite integrated. It's uh, not that easy. I, I know I wish it would be because uh, I don't think uh, the Chinese government and party typically has our interests in mind when they are uh, sort of meddling around with us out in North America. But there, there's not a quick way to go about it. But now if we're talking about something as massive as TikTok, which I don't fully understand. I mean, it's, it's those one minute videos and, and uh, I know I'm getting too long in the tooth and gray to understand it fully. But it is big, and there's a lot of uh, content creators, there's a lot of advertising, and I tell you what, if the Americans suddenly ban that giant platform, it's going to stir things up in, in social media a great, great deal, which maybe it needs to be stirred up anyways. Uh, but, uh, you know, social media is threatening governments in ways that, that they never anticipated. I mean, who would have seen how things are right now, these, these means of communication? And yes, a lot of misinformation, a lot of controlling of the messaging is coming out through social media. But I, I, I fear for having government take more control of it uh, in order, you know, they're not necessarily going to filter it for the common good, even though they always say they will. I'd like to see more providers out there, not fewer. I mean, when you can get more than one source of information, that's how you can counter misinformation. And it does put some of the burden of responsibility on ourselves to research, to look up when you're being fed BS and, and have to... Uh, uh, find the truth, but I still prefer that responsibility landing on our laps than tossing that responsibility to the government saying, please uh, sanitize what I'm going to hear and see and read uh, so, I, so I can avoid misinformation. Because, uh, again, even if they have the best of intentions, when the government controls everything you can see and hear, it's it's probably not going to end, end well for your, your general freedoms. Okay, we're going to get on to our guest here and, and uh, turn the page a little bit. I'm going to run a quick ad and then I'm really been looking forward to this conversation. It's not going to be an easy conversation, but it's an important one and, and certainly a timely one. So uh, let's have a quick ad from one of our sponsors there and we'll get on to uh, lawyer Chris uh, Considine right away. Canadian Shooting Sports Association. Without the CSSA, our gun rights would have been taken long 
long ago. These guys are on the front lines uh, helping to draft smart and intelligent firearms regulations and legislation in Canada. And more importantly, educating the public about how we keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. To become a member, it's absolutely worth every penny. Great. So uh, there we go. Hello, Mr. Considine. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, as I said, I've, I've been looking forward to this conversation. It's, it's, a, it's really going to be coming up in the news pretty soon. Good day to you, Corey, and to your listeners as well. So uh, maybe just to, to give a bit of background, I spoke a little at the introduction of the show, but uh, for some folks who perhaps aren't quite as old as ourselves, uh, it, it was a, a huge issue, of course, throughout the 1990s between with yourself and, and Sue Rodriguez and uh, uh, Sven Robinson did some fantastic work on it. I don't often applaud NDP uh, members of parliament, I have to admit, but in this case, it, it was it was. Uh, I think he did a fantastic job, but uh, things have changed. But the Sue Rodriguez case, if you, if you could kind of put in a nutshell, what would happen there? Certainly. Sue Rodriguez lived in Victoria. She had ALS, which paralyzes you, essentially. It stops uh, various organs functioning. You end up in a wheelchair, unable to speak, feed for yourself, etc. The length of time for which this disease Last is typically two to three years before death, although there are some exceptions, such as Stephen Hawking. Um, Sue came to me, uh, having worked with uh, other broadcasters across the country, uh, explaining her plight. She knew that she was facing, ultimately, the wheelchair. She knew that she'd find it very difficult to feed herself, have a dignity of quality of life, and wanted to have physician assistance to die in a manner which was not just letting her die from the disease itself, but it gave her some control as to when she could die and her timing and saying goodbye to her family and her friends. We went to ultimately the Supreme Court of Canada where we lost on a 5-4 split uh, on the basis that the Supreme Court of Canada felt that the government of Canada should address the issue to allow medical assistance in dying as an option for those who are terminally ill with a physical illness, such as cancer. Yes, and then uh, I, I guess eventually uh, Ms. Rodriguez uh, managed to, to find a, a doctor who anonymously helped her uh, end her, her life eventually, eventually and uh, things moved on. But it took until 2016 before it was really actually legalized, right? Yes, that's right. So many broadcasters, uh, I'm sure including yourself, across the country would periodically revisit the issue. Uh, the population of Canada on various polls were approximately 78 to 80 odd percent in favor of having this as an alternative means for people who are at the end stage of life rather than enduring the ongoing indignities. So Sue, in a way, she lost the war uh, in the sense of going to the Supreme Court of Canada, but she had opened the door, never been opened before in this country, and it was really the first legal test case in the world on the whole issue. And she, as you say, did have the success with a physician coming forward. At that time, it was illegal to help her uh, with her death, and she was very pleased by that opportunity. Since that time, as you know, for those with physical disease, which meets the definition uh, of the revised uh, terms, the, I've, I've heard from many people who have said from their families or from themselves when they're about to have the assistance of MAID, that they welcome this as an alternative. And it should only be regarded, of course, as an alternative. It should only be regarded as an opportunity for people to have an option. So options include refusing to have ongoing medical treatment. Options include refusing to be hooked up to machines or asking to be disconnected from machines. And the options are to let the disease take its course. And then in this particular case is actual made with the proper protocols in place to protect the patients. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's a sensitive, difficult issue. A lot of us don't even, you know, just like necessarily talk about it, but it's something we will all face end of life at one point or another, and then we have loved ones. And there's no, I, I think, you know, sanctity more important than that of our own bodies, uh, particularly when choosing the end. But now, as you'd said, I mean, as well, in the case of uh, Ms. Rodriguez and a lot of others, I mean, it was sort of established, okay, somebody with a terminal illness, that their their standard of living was going to be greatly, greatly uh, deprived. And the one part as well, those typically they were of sound mind. But now the, what I'm wondering is where do we go when we're talking about 
adding it for mental illnesses. I mean, it, those are some very vulnerable people that you're sort of offering an option to. It kind of opens a whole new bag of worms. Yeah, so you, you certainly uh, asked some very interesting questions. So remember that this was for a person who was terminally ill. There was no real prospects of a recovery for them. It was they were going to die, and the question was the option in terms of approach to death. There are, however, two issues on the cognitive side or mental side which have arisen recently. First is that, as you correctly say, Corey, to have made you have to be in your cognitive state of mind. You have to be able to consciously say, I understand the situation and I wish to have made and tell that to the physician administering the maid. For a big issue which has arisen over the last few years has been that what happens when people express that, but they also um, become uh, demented or develop Alzheimer's and are no longer able to express that wish at the end. Can they give advance Directives. So that's one issue, and we're still grappling with that as society. The other big issue which has arisen and is coming up as of uh, March 17th, 2023, in terms of implementation, is made for those with mental illness. They're not necessarily physically ill. They're not terminally ill from a physical perspective, but they're finding that life is intolerable due to a mental illness. And Parliament, uh, this government of Canada, has said that it is prepared as of March 17th, 2023, to permit persons with mental illness, providing they meet certain criteria, to have and seek and have made. But there are a lot of potential problems with that, in my view. Well, yes, uh, absolutely. I, I was looking at one re recent story on this, uh, a lady named Judy LeBlanc. Uh, she, she has a, a mental disorder as her primary condition. Uh, she has an 11, what is it, a, an 11 year old son, I believe, but she's kind of gone back and forth. At times, she feels it's the appropriate uh, path for her, and at times, she doesn't. Well, well, uh, and again, well, she's suffering from mental illness, which can be debilitating, and certainly, people with that are, are suffering. But are they in a position then to make such an irreversible choice? Well, Corey, we need to also look at the big picture of healthcare in this country. Canada at the present time does not have adequate mental health resources in order to allow mental health <clears throat> made to go ahead, in my view, in most circumstances. And as you are aware, uh, 80 psychiatrists approximately a week ago came out as a block and said, we're not re ready for made for persons with mental illness because there's not the fundamental resources available to them so they can make an informed decision. In medicine, are, we always advocate, for, and I'm not a doctor, of course, but I work a lot with doctors and patients. We always advocate for informed decisions. We advocate for that in other professions as well. Here, patients who are mentally ill do not have access to mental faci uh, health facilities in this country. I have worked with many, many people who can't get in to see a psychiatrist often for upwards of a year psychologists often upwards for six months and they have to pay for it themselves. People who are in remote parts of this country have very great difficulty accessing mental health care. Uh, we don't have the resources available by way of facilities if somebody needs to be hospitalized for other than perhaps a few days sometimes. In addition, why is there mental health disorder in certain circumstances? A lot of it relates to a lack of adequate housing, food, happiness with life and opportunities. And until we address some of those issues, again, it may be an easy way for persons to seek an out from the difficulties they experience, but we're not fixing the problems which are underlying the unhappiness that they have. So I think that in only in the most extreme cases should this implementation take place in March, but otherwise I am very concerned that we will see people who can be cured from their depression with the right resources taking MAID. Well, Sid, and with a physiological condition, I think where most people agreed when you're talking about the older polling was when it was pretty much agreed on that the condition was terminal, so there was no treatment available. But as you said, many mental health issues can be stabilized and treated uh, with the proper resources and facilities. So to, to offer that out rather than examining, being able to give that treatment uh, is, is not, uh, 
I guess, a morally acceptable option. And, and some of that discussion is happening as well, though it's a bit more anecdotal, but some people saying they can't get the uh, health resources for their physiological condition as well, and it's left their life so intolerable that they, they want to go for, for made. Uh, well, in that case, shouldn't we be examining how to get those, those resources to them in a more timely manner? Well, certainly with mental health illness, I have seen so many people who've been very, very depressed, who've talked to me about uh, wanting to die. And when they're directed to the right healthcare professionals with the right assistance, medication, counseling, et cetera, like right changes in their life circumstances, they recover from the depression. But if we're not able to provide those options to people, then I'm very, very concerned about permitting to go ahead with MAID. Hopefully the doorkeepers will be the MAID physicians who will also say there are other potential options out there and until those have been exhausted and government has given you the options to pursue, uh, we're not prepared to provide MAID. That's what I hope will take place. Yeah, so that's kind of what I wanted to get to asking. You know, back in the 90s when you were f fighting this cause, was, was what we're looking at today what you were envisioning this evolving to eventually? It's a good question. The Chief Justice Lemaire, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada at the time that I was appearing before him and the court, on Rodriguez had raised that very question. He said, what about those with mental health? And my response to him in court was that we were not yet ready as a Canadian society to go there. We should take made with uh, great care as we explore it. And therefore I advocated for those with grievous physical illness leading to death, that they were terminally ill, should be able to have made. And he, he agreed with that, by the way, as did the subsequent Chief Justice uh, uh, Bev McLaughlin. And ultimately, as you know, uh, everybody agreed with it in the Carter case. As, as a result, of the experiences in the United States, uh, certain states in the United States and in Europe. So I think that was fine. But to go with the mental health at this stage where we don't have the right resources can open some real concerns. The other concerns we see is that it's, if we open it up too much, then we can see a repeat of what happened at Veterans Affairs. And you'll remember several weeks ago, there were some of our fine veterans who do suffer from depression because I've worked with some of them. I know the terrible circumstances they have to confront sometimes. And to be told, well, you can just go get made, even though they're not terminally ill from a physical perspective, is unfortunate. It's a cop-out. Uh, we need to really think about this very, very carefully and provide the resources just as those 80 psychiatrists have advocated. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up with the veterans because that sounded almost like a case, even if perhaps well-meaning, but of coercion. And, and that's a, a whole other issue as well. I mean, the person's choice should be on their own. They should know the alternatives they have, but I, I don't think any medical professionals should be necessarily encouraging people to move in that direction in, in any circumstance. They should just let them know what the alternatives are. Yeah, and I don't think that was a medical professional. I think it was a... Uh, sort of a case officer in Veterans Affairs from what I can gather. But we need, it becomes such an easy cop up say, well, if you're depressed, just take MAID. That's not acceptable, not acceptable in our Canadian society. We have a very fine society. We're regarded as one of the best places in the world to live. And we therefore have a responsibility to those who are less fortunate, whether they be mentally, have mental health issues, which probably many, many people do in our society at one time or another, physical, illness issues, and we need to provide those alternative resources so they can be properly explored. Yeah, so uh, just to, to wrap it up, sort of, and getting back to your area of specialty, though, uh, I, one of the commenters had mentioned, like, do you foresee legal challenges potentially coming from this? I could see this perhaps from family members who have a, a family member who's choosing MAID, but uh, is doing so with a, a mental health uh, disorder. Like, th this probably isn't cut and dry, uh, but as far as the law is concerned. No, I can see in certain circumstances in which a family learns that uh, one of their beloved ones intends to take made with a mental health issue and that those mental health issues alternatives have not been explored properly uh, or made available to the person, that an application could be made to an for an injunction in a courtroom to say, look, this doesn't meet the criteria and this should stop. So it'll be very interesting to follow that through. Great. Well, we've, we've got a lot to examine and think about as we come into this 
uh, I guess, the, the, this issue in these legislative years. I, I really appreciate the work that you did on this in, in the 1990s and uh, and that you're still maintaining, you know, it's, it's not an ideologically fixated view on this by any means. I mean, it's a, it's a challenging, nuanced issue uh, that, that's not cut and dry, and we still need to keep talking about it. So I, I thank you very much for coming on to talk to us today about it. My pleasure, Corey, and thank you for your interest in the subject. Great, thanks. Bye-bye. So there you go, guys. Again, that was a good conversation. Like I said, there, there are no easy answers in this one. This is difficult. And, and I, I really appreciated uh, Mr. Considine coming to talk to us about it because this isn't somebody who uh, was opposed to the concept. Uh, clearly, he, he's very, you know, been invested in, in making sure that people have the ability to have a dignified end of life if they so choose. Again, though, in a circumstance where you have a terminal illness, where your standard of living has, been, you know, has been greatly deprived, and, and you can't turn it around, and most people, as as he mentioned, even the polls back then, agreed with that. But this sort of has turned into something much more, and it's getting concerning, uh, particularly with mental health, and and, and something that. Uh, uh, Mr. Considine said at the end too, with with people having you know bouts of depression or in and out, and that's the thing. Depression isn't necessarily a permanent condition. With with treatment, with therapy, uh, that can be mitigated, and a person's standard of living can be brought up again, or they could change their mind. If you've got a terminal cancer diagnosis, you have ALS, as 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 Ms. Rodriguez did. No, you're not going to. Uh, so then again, that that's where perhaps a person would rather have that option. But, uh, uh, you know, Jet Gorgon saying, uh, you know, and this is fair enough. It may, should not be an option. It's murder. And I mean, that's that's the one polarized view that some people feel, uh, you know, that, that, that there's just no place in any circumstance ever uh, f- for there to be medically assisted uh, end of life. Fair enough. I, I, I don't agree on that one. I just think, though, that we got to be exceedingly careful uh, about who we offer it to, particularly again. I mean, can you think of it? In my view, the, the worst person you could be offering it to is somebody suffering from mental illness. I mean, this is not somebody who who uh, is in, is making good life choices at that point. The other reality is too. I mean, people if if they really want to really want to commit suicide, they typically can. I mean, we, we are fragile creatures. These meat sacks we live in, it, you know, with the, the right poison or, uh, you know, a, a bullet or hanging. There's many, many ways we can manage to end our lives. Uh, aside from some people who are very debilitated, that's some of the difference with uh, the people seeking medical uh, intervention or assistance at the end of life. But uh, when it comes to a mental health disorder, again, whether a person would rather it in a controlled way. But then again, if you're suffering from, from mental health issues, are you really envisioning the best controlled method for yourself. This isn't easy, but I am not comfortable with, with, with offering this with somebody when mental illness is, is their, their problem. I mean, it's not meeting my personal thresholds what I think is acceptable, which means it has to be irreversible. There has to be no cure. There has to be no way that you can turn this around and make a person's life more, uh, you know, the, the standard of living decent. I mean, again, a person suffering from serious mental health disorders their life can be pretty miserable. They can be having a very hard, terrible time, but it doesn't mean it can't be cured necessarily. And uh, again, it's certainly not somebody who can make the choice. It's the choice. It's, it's the most irreversible choice you could possibly ever make. And uh, then the other things we're seeing, is, as was mentioned, basically being offered to veterans, basically because they didn't have the the resources. Well, you know what? It's cheaper if these guys will just go. There was that other gentleman, if you look it up, he, he put it on video because they were, he, he was very sick, but he wanted to live. He wanted to live right to the end and he should have that choice. And they kept offering it him to him and almost pushing it. He recorded it on a phone and had to share it. Like this is what this person in this rough condition is getting is medical professionals pushing it on them. Well, hang on a minute. If they don't want it, leave it alone. Um, there, there, there's those, and uh, you know, here's another interesting point with uh, Judy and Jim Jurotowski, uh, very much like abortion, but it was first brought in. It was supposed to be safe and legal, uh, legal and rare. Uh, we're far from that now. Uh, I'm just talking about how uh, when it gets ideological and almost pushing, I'll give a, a you know, a bit of a, uh, an, an anecdote, a very direct one, a personal one. When I was quite young and 19 years old and suddenly it, it turned out I was going to be a father. And um, the, 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 the girl I was with at the time, we really, you know, we're scared, we're pretty darn young, and we wanted to examine all the options we could. Yeah, we know what the options are and were. 
And uh, we, we went to the, the health clinic in Calgary here and, and sat down with a counselor. We just wanted to find out what's on the table, what's there. Everything from adoption to abortion to raising the child. And that person behind that desk, basically, abortion, 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 abortion. That's all she would counsel. No, no, adoption is not an option. No, you guys aren't in condition to raise children. You're not ready to. Like, this person was fixated on abortion as the option to take. Well, I, we went there to hear options, not single-minded obsessiveness. In the end, by the way, uh, she chose, and it is the woman's right to choose, uh, she chose to keep it. And Lane, our son, he's, he's fantastic and he's alive today. I'm not going to go into whether or not abortion is right or wrong. That's a separate discussion. But I don't like when advocates start pushing it as if it's the only option. And we're seeing that, that, that now with this medical assistance and dying, perhaps, where some of these, these people are turning into advocates within the uh, medical profession and pushing that as the only option. As with this, this, this uh, sick individual out, I believe it was in Ontario. I wish I, I had researched more. I would have gotten his name. You guys probably remember those videos. It made a lot of news because, again, he, he had to actually record the audio to prove how they're pushing this on him for lack of resources. And that goes into a bigger issue, and I've written on this a couple of times, and it's something we've got to dig much more into. And that's people with, a, yeah, mental health issues, and that ties into high crime, it ties into the addiction epidemic, it ties into our health care being overwhelmed. A lot of it is due to, and I noticed Mr. Considine talked about it, though he didn't say it directly, deinstitutionalization. We don't have enough long-term mental health facilities anymore. We went on this track back in the 70s and 80s, pushing people out, saying they're better off within the community and pushing them out of mental health facilities, closing down mental health facilities. I, understandably, they were not always the nicest facilities in the past. And nobody likes to think of a person being secured within a facility, you know, when they wouldn't want to be. But sometimes they can't take care of themselves. And what happens when you push them out in the street? Well, they often end up in prison or they end up in the hospital, or they end up committing suicide, or they end up self-medicating, and that's how we get a lot of the people addicted to meth, fentanyl, and so many other things, because they don't know where to go. And if we had the mental health facilities that could properly treat the specialized facilities for people who are in serious me mental distress, again, they could be treated, stabilized, and living as good a life as possible, but still, yes, sometimes for life in a secure environment. Right now, yeah, we, we have our, our mental health hospitals, but they are of a very, very last resort and typically only for people who would be very dangerous to themselves or others if they were released. Otherwise, they typically use wards within existing hospitals for uh, mental health uh, treatment and things like that, which isn't appropriate. It doesn't give a good standard of living. You're stuck on a, a wing or a floor on a hospital. I mean, you can build campuses. You can make decent lives for people. We've got to turn that deinstitutionalization trend around. And you know what? As part of what Mr. Considine was pointing out, if you have all of those that you can offer somebody with mental health challenges, when you can say, look, this is where we can treat you. This is where we can help you. This is, and if all of that fails, sort of like with the physiological, when there's no other options, that's when you can start looking at MAID. But right now, we've got a whole bunch of options. We just aren't providing them right now. We talk about our healthcare system and how it's failing, and it is failing at a lot of levels. These people who think Canada's system's universal, it's great, it's fantastic. As he pointed out, no, it's not. Mental health is very much a health issue, and you got to pay out of top pocket for a psychiatrist. you got to pay out of pocket for the medications that might help you, for the psychologist or counselors that could help a person with mental health challenges. That's not covered in the universal thing, but they're very real health issues. So they recognize that mental health is such a serious health issue that it could lead to offering medically assisted dying, but it's not a serious enough health issue that we'll cover it under our supposed universal health care system. Seems to be a bit of a conflict going on there. Again, we need to re-examine our entire system. The problem is, too, is our system is stretched more thin than it, you know, than it can handle. We, can't, we don't, can't afford to get any bigger. But we're into those battles. We're watching that in Alberta. We're watching that everywhere. Hospitals are being overwhelmed across the entire country, yet nobody wants to admit you could do anything else with them aside from pour more money into them. You listen to Rachel Notley. Money, 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 money. Well, that's because her priority is union jobs, not the health of people. There are a lot of universal health systems all over the world that are outperforming us, many of them in Europe. They're still universal. They still cover everybody, but they're different systems. They allow more private provision. They allow more flexibility. And guess what? You know, when you go to those areas, quite often what they also cover, which we don't have covered here, optical, auditory, 
uh, and mental health prescriptions, things like that. Sometimes you might pay a little more for it, but boy, you get a heck of a lot more coverage for it. But we got to examine the whole system. And uh, what's this uh, Saxon of Riverstone saying? They closed the, the Queen Street Mental Health Care uh, in Toronto in 1985. Just pushed them in the streets. It was a horrible way to treat people. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, and they just pushed them out. They think they're doing better. I think most people are well-meaning, but not necessarily. Uh, I, I wrote a piece on my blog years ago, but I remember because it struck me. I was out on the road and I was driving. And I saw, you know, a dumpster diver. This, this fellow's in these getting stuff out of a, a you know, garbage and he's getting bottles and food. And I realized that, that the filthy jacket he's wearing, this, this, this team type jacket, was actually a Special Olympics jacket. Now, this guy, and he was relatively young. I don't know what his story was. Maybe he didn't even originally have the jacket, but I suspect he might have. Now, this isn't a case of somebody with you know, mental health depression like that, but this is also somebody that perhaps needs more uh, help in the community than others. And somehow, no, no, we've closed those facilities. You can live uh, on the, you know, community living and so on. Well, they can't, and they end up on the streets. Uh, Missioner Center, if people know it in Alberta, they've shut down most of that. That was a, a center in Red Deer that took care of a lot of people with serious de developmental disorders and things such as that. And yes, it was a large institutional style campus and uh, hey, they did some bad things there. And you know, they, they, back in the 60s, 50s, they did eugenics. They were sterilizing. Uh, Ashley just brought it up there. Yeah, recalling as a kid, mentally ill, being sterilized. There was a big case in Alberta. Uh, Lilani Muir, Muir, M U I R was her name. And she sued. This was back when, when Ralph Klein was premier. Uh, that led to almost uh, the, the invocation of the notwithstanding clause. I believe Klein blinked and compensated all those people who had been sterilized. But you see, just because the area had some negative history doesn't mean you throw out the whole institution. Uh, there were some interesting discussions at that time. I, I remember when they were closing it, I went to a meeting where people were talking about what was going to happen to the residents. Like, there's people living in those, those institutions. They've been there all their lives. They're comfortable there. The stable environment helps them there. And there's things that could be offered nowhere else. Uh, one of the things a mother brought up was that's the only place where her son can get his teeth taken care of. Once a month, a specialized dentist who deals with people with developmental disabilities, the serious ones, can get in and get in their mouths. Because these aren't, you can get your finger bitten off. I mean, I'm being serious about this. This is a specialty. You've got to work very carefully with people in there. You can't just take somebody in that circumstance to a specialized, to just any dentist. I mean, this is just one area of specialty I'm talking about. When you have it together in one larger space, you can afford and you can bring in those specialties to help the people that are living there. It doesn't have to be bad. Don't let the negative experiences and, and, and mistakes we made in the past stop us from, from keeping the entire thing going. Well, either way, big discussions and challenging ones, but, uh, well, we got to keep having them. It says I've talked about on here before too. We talk about things like medical assistance and dying and things like that. I mean, it has to be discussed because that legislation is coming, but I don't like discussing it. I've said it on here before. I'm terrified of death. It freaks me right the hell out. I want to put it off as long as I possibly can, but whether I am terrified of it or not, chances are it's going to get to me at some point or another. And uh, we need to discuss these things. Uh, so whether I like the issue or not, we're going to talk about it. Uh, let's see. I just want to touch on this before we get in uh, with, with Jim and talk about some of the agricultural things. This was something I saw on Twitter yesterday. Because, you know, the campaign is on. The campaign is on in Alberta in full bore. Our radio ads are overwhelmed with the Alberta Federation of Labor, which is acting as a branch of the NDP. NDP ads all over the place. UCP ads all over the place. The TV ads are starting. Oh, my God. We got five more months of this. And they're just, they're just warming up. But Notley's Twitter account has just been unhinged. I mean, it's just firing these tweets out all over the place, promising anything and everything. She's going to promise people more... Uh, you know, better suntanning uh, methods in summer or something pretty soon, anything to get herself back in. Well, she made this big promising, we're going to bring rural high-speed internet to every household in Alberta when we come back into power. Well, wait a minute. Jane looked that up. Notley promised that way back when she first got into power. She didn't do it then. Why the hell would she do it now? Not to mention, as many, many commenters pointed out, uh, Starlink's here. Elon Musk already did what you guys have been twiddling your thumbs about. And I get it. Kenny didn't bring his high-speed internet in the uh, rural areas either. Nobody's done it. Everybody promises it. Nobody does it. Now I've got Starlink up on top of my house out there. We'd been using the TELUS hub. It sucked. It was getting overwhelmed. Uh, Starlink was a game changer in the rural areas. But this is how behind the times Notley is. Uh, 
we're going to promise high speed internet. No, the private market took care of that, Madam Notley. Uh, try to move on to some more valid promises and uh, see if we can uh, get something more productive out of this. All right. I've ranted, pitched, and pissed and moaned long enough. Let's talk about some agricultural commodities with uh, uh, Jim Buzicombe from Marketplace Commodities. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good, good, Corey. How are you doing? Uh, not too bad, actually. It's It's been a really interesting show, and uh, yeah, it's good to cool it down a little and uh, yeah, check I, I, uh, things out in the real world there. I didn't know Notley was offering any, any tanning products, but uh, but uh, anyway, if you say so, I'll one. go with that. <laughs> I, I gotta say she hasn't put it up yet but i, I oh. mean just uh, they seem to have anything what can we possibly promise to coax people into coming in and uh they're promising things we've already got so we'll see what's next <laughs> all right good, so good. Uh, you, you'd sent me some notes on uh, uh some of the stock estimates uh for the year worldwide uh i don't have those images uh right prompted here but uh we, we've got some commodity numbers okay yeah okay so we're <laughs> Yes, we'll go over. Uh, so last week's Friday, USA report. Yeah, no, that's okay. I'll, I'll go over some of the quick numbers here. So the previous week, we talked about stats can. So that would be Canadian production numbers across all of Canada. Last week, Friday, USDA came out with their United States uh, crop production estimates and also world stock estimates. And I'm not going to quote all the numbers because I don't think anyone's going to remember it. But really, like the short of it is we've seen roughly normal production in the United States stocks are roughly where we'd want to see them at this time of the year. And, um, even across the world, we have good stocks. Uh, corn stocks are slightly lower than, um, the previous year at this time. Uh, soybean stocks are growing. Wheat stocks are, are roughly the same. So, you know, what I was going to say about the reports is that in most, in many ways, they're actually a bit of a boring report and maybe, uh, it doesn't give us much to talk about from the excitement of numbers, but that's a good thing. That means we're producing enough commodities across the producing nations in the world to feed the people and to provide feed for animals. And that's more or less the short of it. Is there, there are enough uh, decent crops um, across Canada, United States, even other places, Ukraine, Russia, Australia, etc., there's all, always problem spots, but uh, generally speaking, world stocks look pretty good. Yeah, well, I noticed on that report also, it, it talked about uh, 2022, 2023 uh, China imports. I was talking a bit about China and just how, you know, whether we like it or not, our economies are very integrated. I mean, we, we, we take in a lot of manufactured products from them and they take a lot of our uh, raw resources, whether it's, 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 you know, agricultural commodities or, or petrochemical products even. Uh, but these are things I imagine you've got to watch. Like this is the consumer downstream and, and, and trying to watch the trends of where they're going to be going with what they're consuming. Yeah. So China continues to buy a lot of soybeans from the United States. They, of course, buy a lot of soybeans. And I should also say a lot of other commodities from around the world. But the U.S. exports more soybeans to China than any other single country. Um, and that carries on. Uh, we've seen numerous geopolitical issues over the last year, especially in the last weeks, months, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, Argentina, China, Taiwan, et cetera, et cetera. But the trade still carries on. Those are things that people should be concerned about. Um, there is enough product across this world in some ways, but the geopolitical issues is what affects um, deliveries. It affects uh, logistics, steamship lines, uh, you know, they you know, going to and from certain ports like port congestion in various places and so on. So that's really, I, I keep a good eye on what's happening as far as um, logistics. Uh, not really any shortages of supply, but whether countries continue to trade with each other or whether there's trade issues or other geopolitical conflicts that affect trade. Yeah, well, and I, I mean, in the prairies, we don't typically see soybean grown, but I mean, with those commodities will still impact, I guess, other crops or considerations you're taking out here because it, it uh, impacts what's going to be grown in, in eastern states or eastern Canada then, right? Yeah, to some extent, it would be that. But what I would look at uh, in comparison to soybeans in Canada, we'd look at canola. So they both are used to produce vegetable oil. Soybeans are crushed and uh, soybean oil is extracted from that, obviously. And here in Canada we would crush canola and would have canola oil. Canola oil tends to trade at a premium to soybean oil, but 
nonetheless, those two commodities will trend similar in price. They will, there'll be some variance on how much of a premium canola will trade over top of soybeans, but they largely will follow the same general trend. Great. Well, always such a, a big picture to always have to watch. Uh, <laughs> must be fun watching your computer screen with all those numbers, but that's what your specialty is. And that, that's the services you guys provide. Uh, so uh, Marketplace Commodities is the, the website, I believe. Yes, it is. www.marketplacecommodities.com and 403-394-1711. We're always happy to talk to any of you. So please give us a call, shoot us a message, and uh, let's leave her at that. Excellent. Well, thanks for the update this week, Jim, and we will talk to you again soon. All right. Take care, Corey. Bye-bye. Thanks. So that is Jim Buzikum from uh, Marketplace Commodities. And yes, he comes on every week. And it's just such a uh, big, immersive business and industry, you know. And and I mean, a lot of us who are, uh, well, I I live rurally, but I'm not a farmer by any means. But, uh, you know, you you get those romanticized notions of a small operation and and, uh, sustenance farming. But those days, for the most part, are are long gone. It's a big business and uh, you're dealing with some very large numbers and commodities like anything else. And and you really have to watch what you're putting in and what you're putting out. And, And of course, you know, on top of doing everything else you've got to do around the farm and around your production facility. And uh, that's where these guys provide those services to look at the whole commodity aspect of it. So check them out, marketcommodities.com. All right, let's see what else we got going on. Speaking of China, China. You know, it was the only thing I liked about Trump was the way he pronounced China, just because it was great on so many people that we're China. Other than that, I don't really miss the orange bugger. But, uh, you know, again, they, they keep coming up and keep coming up. And uh, cabinets, this is uh, yesterday, says they don't know the names. Uh, So we've probably heard this news story and things like that. Uh, Don't know the names of the 11 federal candidates uh, allegedly targeted by Chinese communist agents in the 2019 elections. The House Affairs Committee hasn't been able to uncover any evidence, uh, new evidence, uh, you know, regarding those claims. I got a feeling, let's just go out on a limb, that if and when we ever find out who those 11 candidates were in the federal election who had some help from the Chinese government, the Chinese communist government, they will be liberals. I could be wrong, but I'm going to go out on a limb and suspect that's the case. And with that being the case, the chances of an internal government investigation ever (laughs) exposing that is extremely slim. So I won't hold my breath on finding out exactly which candidates those were, but who knows? Things leak, things move along. And, uh, Maybe things will change. Uh, You know, here's something of the uh, cabinet bill. Yes, Bill 21. We've talked about that. The firearms, they kept expanding it. They're looking to steal your firearms. We know that. They've wanted to for a long time. And uh, it looks like now uh, it's been so delayed. Basically, they've screwed it up. They bit off more than they can chew. And it's going to go into spring. And uh, uh, they tried to rush it through the Public uh, Safety Committee, it looks like. uh, But opposition MP said, no, no, we're not going to let you rush this. So they've run out of time. It's going to go to spring. Maybe maybe uh, some reality will be injected into this thing and that thing is going to be shelved because, I mean, there's no fixing that damn thing. But uh, they'll push on it. They want it. Justin wants your firearms. He wants your little uh, 22 with the uh, semi-automatic because, you know, while it never actually has been used in any mass shootings, he wants to imply that you would if you dared have that gopher gun in your possession or grandpa's old duck gun in the basement and things like that. But either way, the, the bill got delayed It is kind of a decent sign in a sense. Uh, We got a lot of other things to look forward to. Christmas is coming up, guys. Things are slowing down, but we still got a couple more shows before the end of the year. On the 28th, I am going to have Franco Terrazano in to do an end-of-year sort of update from the Taxpayers Federation. Next week, I'll have somebody coming in to chat with us, and we'll discuss some issues in general. And, of course, there'll be plenty more news and ranting and raving and stuff to cover then. So... Thanks for tuning in today, guys, and we will see you next week at the same time. It's a tough job, so I take care of my mental health. I get eight hours of sleep and eat as healthy as I can. It's actually starting to catch on. And if I ever need more support, I call 211.